Good morning, Nordic Data Science and Machine Learning Summit. My name is uh, Frederik Jansson, and I head up the Nordic Sales Engineering team at Snowflake. And this, this is actually live, so it's not pre-recorded. I'm here with you today, even if not in physical person. I'm very excited to be here today, and I've been listening in on the opening notes and the panel and a lot of the interesting discussion there uh, about where the field is moving. And it was everything from where the models like the BERTs and the GPT-3s are having the most impact. We also heard a lot about how the different roles of data scientists have changed over the years and how we've moved from like traditional systems that were just a few years ago cutting edge. Today, I want to tie back into that and talk a little bit about the Snowflake Data Cloud and what that means for us when we're trying to solve some of these challenges of data science with data. Because it is one of those potentially overlooked discussions, but I think that we touched upon it very nicely in the panel discussion, actually. So, first of all, the Snowflake Data Cloud is all about bringing down the data silos and bridging those gaps that we have between data sources in our organizations. It is all about letting organizations as a whole access, work with, and use data. For a long time, getting access to the data has really been one of the biggest challenges, and, and it has the potential to really block or stop a lot of the potential we see in data dead in its tracks as we're trying to get value from it. So what does all of this have to do with data science? And why do I think that this might even be a bigger deal than getting that better tooling or products specifically for the data science teams? And don't get me wrong, I am quite excited about all of these new abilities that we're seeing in this area, especially everything from better tooling to wrangle data, extract features, run our experiments, collaborate on models, and so on. But I don't think that that's really the thing that is holding data science back today. So let me go back a little here. I think that we have all in these discussions seen the articles, the hype about data being the new oil or some sort of untapped natural resource that virtually all companies sit on, but very few utilize. Well, the thing is that discussion has been ongoing for quite some time now. And I don't think that we've still or yet seen those massive benefits where we have businesses at scale transforming to becoming fully data-driven, right? With AI and ML infused in every process. We're moving in that direction, but it's going slowly, right? And there really is this implied value that's assigned to data when you start likening it to oil, right? You expect it to behave like oil to have a value just like oil, right? And right there, the data scientists are seen as these highly sought after alchemists who will transform this crude raw data into pure gold, right? The good news is that you as data scientists probably have all of the skills and the competence to do just that. The bad news is that you most of the time do not have access to what you actually need to do that. And by that, I don't mean faster Python runtimes or, or something like that, even if it would be nuts, right? It's almost like you're taking data scientists and throwing them into this fight with one hand tied behind their back. The thing that is the, flu uh, the fuel and the blood that pumps through all of this is the data. So in a sense, that metaphor is right, but it's not flowing, right, to be honest. It's more of a forced trickle of data. So I think you might see where I'm going with this, right? But why is it like this? Why is it so hard to get this value from data? To dig into that, I think we need to roll back the tape a little and look at where the first data silos come from and what they actually mean for us. So starting with, what we today might call legacy applications. So we have these applications or domain-specific databases tied to them. Relational databases, 
built, tuned to run those specific workloads of a specific application or domain. While those are usually very, very good at delivering on the requirements of that target application, that's also all they were ever built for. If you try to combine it with any other workload or application, you start running at the risk of affecting performance, stability of the intended application. Now, over time, organizations will multiply have, uh, naturally have multiple of, of these databases. And this is where the big challenges start. Obviously, organizations will want to be able to look at data coming from multiple of these sources or applications, the data silos. Now, as we started seeing that question, we started seeing the concept of the data warehouses coming into play. We wanted to allow organizations to onboard data from all of these sources uh, into one common place, a warehouse. Now, the warehouse solved a lot of the earlier challenges and gave us this dedicated environment for analysis of this data without affecting the source systems. Great. However, the next challenge came uh, and, and it was that the data warehouses didn't really scale as the data volumes coming into them started to grow, and it naturally does. Companies ought to make more processes. Hopefully, their market share grows and they acquire new customers or more business. More things leave a digital trace, and we produce ever-growing volumes of data in just about everything we do, right? So the data warehouses of that time simply couldn't keep up. It was either a matter of cost as scaling the underlying cluster to a size where it is no longer economically defensible to do so, or a trade-off of performance and sacrificing the ability to efficiently work on the data. You will get things like, do you want to do the monthly financial report or do you want to do this new machine learning project? You can't have both, I'm sorry. Well, guess which one gets prioritized at the company if that's the rubric. Now, the next evolutionary step that we started seeing was the data lake, both as a technology and as a concept coming into play. You stand up a very large cluster, you put a data lake on it, and there you can simply pour in all of the data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, and you let that be your unifying solution. So really good concepts, like some groundbreaking concepts, really. And they solve challenges around working with the structured and semi-structured data jointly, right? It also introduced a lot of complexity in the technical solution, though. It really, most of the time, requires companies to employ very dedicated teams of specialists that could work with, maintain, and tune these data lakes. And that naturally limits the ability of the data lake to deliver value out to a larger organization, as you really need the specialist competence to work with it, right? And you're not going to get everybody in the organization to have that skill set. A common scenario at a company is that a lot of effort goes into onboarding data from the organization into the data lake, but not really the same effort goes into getting the data out of there. Data goes in, but not so much goes out. So the data lakes didn't really fully solve the problem at its core either. We're not still seeing them as the end solution here. Now, it's not all darkness and challenges, right? Uh, I think it was at about this point where we started seeing more and more moves to the cloud. Most of the time, it was along the lines of re-hosting the same type of solutions in the clouds, essentially swapping the underlying infrastructure. We're still dependent on clusters and, and these more or less static assignments of how much storage and compute resources do you get to work with. Some of the hard work, the uh, hardware-centric work, went away, but a lot of it still remained. You still need to spend time in tuning clusters. You still need to spend time on scaling storage. You still need to spend time on optimizing performance. For this, Snowflake went the other way. To separate the storage and compute needs for resources as a means to address those challenges of scale, performance, and cost, right? So by using the elasticity of the cloud, each one could be provisioned separately and providing flexible storage, mostly as we're scaling up and we're growing, but also scaling down where we don't need to store things, saving cost. 
And you don't have to scale up the cluster and think about what it means as you have to add another node or something. The same goes for compute. When you need it, it adds computational resources and you can crunch even the most heavy queries, right? And a quite interesting example of this is, is Sainsbury's, a UK-based, very large retailer. When they move their analytics queries and, and their data science to Snowflake, they first thought it was broken as their query time went from six hours to three seconds. But it wasn't broken. It just scaled the compute in a way they've never been able to before. So this cloud infrastructure, it lets user scale storage and performance and only pay for what they use. And that opens up some things. You have this single copy of the data. So the data can be used in just about any scenario. You have a platform that mostly takes care of itself as you get it 100% delivered as a service. You don't have to take care of the infrastructure, the tuning, the maintaining of partition schemes and so on. Because if the organization is left to do it, it would be a little bit like the old data lakes. You would have isolated specialist teams and there would be a big burden on them to do a lot of the work for the entire organization. And it wouldn't be available to the entire organization. The other thing, security and access controls needs to be built into the platform from the ground up. It, it can't be bolted onto the solution as an afterthought or something you have to worry about maybe not being there. Because you don't want to start off your data science project and then have security shoot it down. If the data is secured by default, you're free to innovate with it. Last part, the virtually unlimited scale and performance as pretty much the entire cloud can be yours when you need to. The important part, only when you need to, and, and that's really important, right? You don't want to be paying for the entire cloud all the time, only when you're actually using it. So you get the performance, which means that your data science projects are no longer deprioritized when pitted against regular reporting and business intelligence and, and uh, insights work. And this is great, really great. It solves some of these tough challenges as well, right? But the most interesting thing here, I think, is what happens is that now that storage is no longer bound to a specific infrastructure cluster, it really opens up for something else. It opens up for data to be moved without the effort of physically having to move or copy. It opens up for data to be shared. But data is being shared already, you then say. Yes, yes it is. But look at how we're doing that today. It is usually quite a lot that goes into that how. A lot of effort. First, you figure out how to move the data. And it's often a matter of, of sending files, maybe calling APIs or running it through some complex integration solution or an enterprise service bus. And for all that, you need the infrastructure to run it on, both on the consuming side and on the providing side. Then you need to develop and build the service to pack, send, and on the other side, receive, unpack, and then get that data in some kind of storage on the receiver, like a database, maybe a new database. And all of that you need to maintain over time so it doesn't break and patch it for secure different abilities and so on. And you need to monitor it for failures constantly. You need to make sure it's up and running, that it's pumping the data, right? And again, not to mention security, right? Most of the time you end up with a variety of different models for securing data and the transferring those integrations. It could be anything from very secret passwords to tokens and certificates. Likely you will see all of those three come into play at a company, right? And once the data is transferred, the provider of the data no longer has access control over it. It can really go anywhere and to anybody when it's over on the other side. You need to build an access control mechanism as well. Now, all of this, while doable and solved and done at companies, it really mounts up to a lot of effort. So the net effect may be that we're not exchanging as much data as we could, because the effort for each one of these is really non-trivial. The data stays in the silos a lot of the time. Again, what does all of this mean for data science? Aren't these the things that the enterprise data teams should look after and solve for? 
Well, yes, maybe, sort of, but do they? Let's look a bit. We know that a lot of the big data, the analytics, the AI and data science projects actually don't yield the results that were um, hoped for. And is that because we don't have the right data science tools? Is it because the data science teams are lacking the skills to solve these problems? I really don't think so. And even if we're seeing some great advancements in tools and frameworks that are really helping our data science teams, I don't think that the core of the challenge sits there. And I will surely take some nice integrated scholar Python run time in my data platform any day, please, thank you. But it's not the problem I'm getting here at. So break it down. What usually happens when you kick off a new data science project? You start with looking at the data that's out there and you try to figure out what you can do with it. Maybe you have an hypothesis of what it can yield for you. The first thing you need to do is get your hands on the data. So what do you get? Perhaps you get the snapshot of some database, perhaps a production database, maybe a CSV file is sent to you. Great. The first step you need to do is to clean the data from that CSV file so that you now can work with it. And you get that in a form that you can use it. All right. Next, you also need to think again about, is there sensitive data in there? Maybe PII. Now that you are moving a data set around in other solutions than it was originally secured in, you need to think about that data not ending up in the wrong place. So maybe you need to do some masking or anonymization of the data. So you can solve for that challenge as well, right? Okay, great. Now you can work with it. You fire up the experiments, you train the model. It's all good. Well, the next challenge, the snapshot you got is now stale. And you want to get a fresh copy of it, retrain. Well, then it's back to CSV file cleaning, masking, and so on. And then there is the question of plugging the model back into the operational side of the data. You know, that, so that it actually brings value back to the business, as was intended, right? You don't want to end up in that AI prototyping graveyard, uh, I think somebody mentioned previously. So all of this are things that make it harder to actually realize the value of data science in the business. And nowhere in that was there a mention of data science itself being hard. And data science is hard, yes. But that is the actual job we want to focus on, right? So if the data isn't available to data scientists, or at least discoverable and easy to get access to, then a lot of the effort is actually put on the data science teams to go out into the organization, go to the different data silos, grab the data, do all of the hard work to get it somewhere where they can work with it. With all that in mind, maybe the old saying that 80% of data science is cleaning data isn't so hard to understand where it comes from. Quite unfair, really, but maybe not too far from the truth either. So when Snowflake created the data cloud, it was with this determination to bridge the gaps between all of the data silos that prevents us from getting full value of the data. That meant that the data cloud had to work the same way on all the major cloud providers, so that users wouldn't have to be locked into their choices of cloud provider. Now, this can be understood if you consider the impact of running your data platform in a solution on one specific cloud provider only. For that, there may or may not then exist a marketplace out there and even some ability to directly share data between certain of the services on that platform. And that could help you share or consume data from somebody else that sits on that very same platform and also uses the same services. Now the challenge has come when you run into this fantastic data set or data source out there that you absolutely just have to have for your experiment. Well, if that source is not hosted on the same platform that you are on, then you're back into the tedious process of moving, not sharing that data, and you run the risk of not using it in your work or spending 80% of the time getting that data over. So by relying on a single cloud platform 
your effective reach is partially limited to the data sources from providers who have made the same platform choice as your organization. That gives you quite a narrow subset of the potential market, to be frank. For any given provider you're on, you will be able to reach 12 to 40% of the market, depending on which one it is that you're on. And that is of the market that's in the cloud and on one of the cloud providers, by the way. Now, this is why the global data mesh was such an important step for Snowflake when it came to bridging the gaps. Okay, so we've talked about what I find to be one of the most important aspects of succeeding with data science, often perhaps overlooked. And we tend to spend a lot of time discussing what are the frameworks, what are the models that are most effective to work with, or which tools gives us the best environment for training a model, and so on. And this part is very important and very interesting, right? So I would also like to outline how Snowflake actually fits in with all of these tools and frameworks for data science. And we will see a bunch of examples here today. First, I think that the space for frameworks and tools for data science is just phenomenal. It's just amazing because there is a wealth of it out there. The challenge is, is if you have to stick with a single one. Often, it's not the case that a single framework or tool can give us everything we want. We commonly see a combination of them. Now, if this was a physical conference and uh, I was here in front of you, I could ask to see a show of hands for who uses which framework and which tools and so on. And I think that we would see quite a spread across the room. And that, that is fantastic. I think that shows how live this space is right now. And that is exactly what we want to support with the platform approach and the data cloud. For you to be able to connect to and really use the thing that works best for you. So when it comes to languages, we support SQL, Scala, Java directly in the platform. More coming as we're building out the native support for that gives you the, the ability to directly work with the platform and, and get access to this extremely fast processing engine directly in your experiments. Or just connecting it to a, the environment of your choice. And this is where it's really important to allow for a wider ecosystem, of all of the third party solutions, frameworks and tools. Tools like Data IQ, where Snowflake is a native object directly in it and you get this direct push down of query to Snowflake when you're running anything from R, Python, PySpark, Skikit, Xibuz, Keras, so on. Or like Data Robot, leader in AutoML, but they also let you work with anything from R, Python, Spark, ML, pretty much any open source model. And it connects directly to Snowflake. Or Amazon SageMaker, for those who really want to run notebooks and AutoML natively on AWS. Or Zeppel, which is actually part of Data Robot now as of a few weeks back that really lets you work with Jupyter and Zeppelin notebooks, directly connecting to the data coming from Snowflake. Many, many more. And that's the point. There is so much out there. And we think that support for all of this is more important than the native support for one specific framework built into the platform. And this is exactly what we see our customers who are successful with Snowflake and really leveraging data from sources all over internal data sources, external data sources, publicly shared, privately exchanged. They are really taking advantage of all of that, connecting all of the data and bringing it into their data science work. We have fantastic customers like Ian Shuck, who you will hear more about later today, as Stephen talks about their journey to building value through data science. Customers like Tel2 has built this advanced customer insights based on a single source of truth for all the data. It all stays in Snowflake and that fuels their insights models. So the future of working with data science is bright, I think. And one of the key ingredients is to get the data flowing, to make sure that the organization can actually support the mission of the data science in transforming the way we get value out of the data. We want to allow the organization to support the work of the data 
science teams and transforming our businesses that way. And to do that, they need to provide the data to the data science teams. And they will only do so if they have a platform that will support the movement of data. With the data cloud, the data is flowing the way it's really meant to. All right, if you found that encouraging, I encourage you to join us for Summit also on June 8th to 10th, where you will get a chance to be a little bit deeper into the success of, of customers and look at some of the advancements in the platform and listen in on the sessions on how you can move your solution to the data cloud. Thank you. Oh, oh.